So we are now recording. Um, so I know Lori's here, but I've um, offered to um, see if we could get somebody to step in as um, chair for this one meeting. Lori's got a lot on her plate right now. So um, just to give her a little slack. And also um, we will need a minute taker. So Dwayne did it last time. So if somebody could step up. So Steve, you want to be the minute taker? Yeah, I saw my name was underneath Dwayne's under on the last minute. So I set up to start taking minutes. Okay, great. We did skip over a few people, but that's fine. Oh, I, I don't think I've taken them for a while, so I don't yeah. mind. Okay. All right. So, well, so the first um, agenda item tonight uh, is to... You, um, want, you still want someone to chair? Yes. So that's the first agenda oh, item is okay. to is the vote for a chair pro tem. So, Lori, we can't hear you. I saw you look like you were trying to speak. <laughs> no, I can't hear you. And it doesn't look like you're muted. Oh, you know, your microphone doesn't show up at all. So I'm not sure if it's got to do with your computer setting. It took me a little while to join audio. Yeah, I think this is different though. Like her microphone doesn't even show up. Um, She's just muted. So, um, can I nominate someone? Um, yeah. <laughs> yes, just giving, I think we're all set now. Yep. There we go. Okay. So now that Lori is, now that Lori is fully, um, <laughs> here, <laughs> now we can proceed. So, um, so we're going to start with the vote for chair pro tem for this one meeting. So I wanted to see if there was first anybody who wanted to self nominate. I'm I'm happy to to do it. I don't know, you know, you guys seem like a nice enough group that even if I make a mistake, it should be okay. <laughs> no, you're in big trouble, Jesse. <laughs> I do run a meeting with a pretty strong hand, so. <laughs> um, is there anyone else who's interested in sharing this meeting? Okay. So does anyone want to make a motion for Jesse to serve as our chair pro tem? I move that Jesse Selman be pro tem chair for this meeting. I second. Okay. Thank you, Jesse. Okay. And then I'm going to get um, ask for a voice vote. And again, this is in no particular order. Um, Rose? Yes. Roof? Yes. Selman? Abstain? You can vote for yourself. It's really okay. All right. Yes. <laughs> Awkward, but it's okay. Good. Gregor? Yes. And Goldner? Yes. Okay. Jesse, I turn the um, virtual gavel over to you. All right. Thank you, Steve, for doing the minutes. I believe we now review the previous meetings minutes, which I typically we have read ahead of time. Um, so if anybody wants to comment or move to approve, I'm happy to put them up on the screen as well. I move we approve them. Do we have a second? My second. Great. And then the vote, uh, voice vote. Again, no order. Um, Rose? Yes. Roof? Yes. Selman? Yes. Gregor? Yes. Goldner? Yes. All right. The minutes are approved. And I'm going to look. We have now public comment. We have three attendees. Uh, if anybody is would like to make public comment, please raise your virtual hand, Janet. And okay, Stephanie Janet, could you in. unmute yourself and you can go ahead, Janet. I think I'm unmuted. Hi, um, I'm Janet McGowan. I am live at 706 Southeast Street. I'm a member of the planning board and the solar bylaw working group. Um, I know you're going to be talking about priority sites for solar, and I can't attend the whole meeting because I have to get ready for my planning board meeting tonight. So I, I'm jumping in here. And you know, I think for guidance on this, um, I 
encourage you to do what I'm doing, which is looking at the state climate action plans for 2020 to 2030 and 2050. And those plans call for increasing the amount of protected natural working lands, um, which are wetlands, farms, forests, um, and um, for their ecological services, as well as you know other sort of more aesthetic things. But they do a lot of work for us. Um, and then the plans also call for increasing the amount of forest land, making forest um, harvesting more productive that can actually lead to greater carbon sequestration and use of wood, and also increasing the amount of protected farmland, even subprime soils. Um, and so that, that kind of call is echoed in the really strong um, CARP, the Climate Action and Resilience Plan that your committee put together. And that also calls for the protection of natural working lands and to increase local food production, which I think is what's sort of great is we see that happening and we see more local food going to low income communities. Um, and so the climate act, the CARP really outlines in a lot of detail the ecological services provided by um, our natural working lands. And it also calls for putting solar on the built environment. And you know, as you look around Amherst, and all I do really now is drive around stand, staring at rooftops and parking lots, is you can see that most of the rooftop and asphalt is at our large institutions, um, the university, the colleges, and you know, municipal buildings, our, our schools. Although there's ample rooftops and parking lots at commercial um, stores and also the residential areas in terms of rooftops and maybe even as we say a lawn which um we're looking to more things so you know for me you know we did a you know when we did the survey the gza survey also mimics these calls for action which is to prioritize putting solar on the built environment um particularly to protect forest land and then um forest and also farms and look at dual use agricultural um, solar, which I know is a sort of an experimental thing in Massachusetts, but definitely worth, worth looking at. I also think that, you know, our farmland, our prime soils are really precious, but we have a lot of organic farming in our community and a lot of farms looking to no-till, which is also increasing carbon sequestration as well as the strength of the soils. And so, um, so that's, that's sort of my advice or my urge, you know, my recitation of the different plans that I've been reading. And so I encourage you, as you look at the priorities, to look at the plans that have already been taking place with careful study. Thank you. Okay, if anyone else from the public is interested in making a comment at this time, please raise your hand. I also, just to, since I don't see any hands up, just to respond to Janet and say that that's a great, it, I we very much appreciate um, that that you know this type of comment based on research, et cetera. You're obviously involved in in other groups in town, so thank you for for taking the time to come to our meeting as well. Um, I'm a huge fan of soil as a part of this whole puzzle personally, so. I'm a, huge, I'm a huge fan of plans because I we have so many great plans in town. I'd love to see us just implement them and not oh. debating it. Just let's go forward. So thank you so much. I appreciate your work. I mean, I, I love the, the CARP. So thanks. Awesome. Thank you. Um, all right. I do not see anyone else with a hand up. And I see our next agenda item, I believe, is transportation and pace with Dee and Don, and they are both absent. So we're going to, I think, cross those off. Um, go on to number five, the specialized stretch code. Um, Lori, I don't know if you have anything prepared, but I did get a chance to meet with Stephanie today, um, That's along with yeah, the, right. um, I just sent a um, the slides from last week. I think I forgot to send them right after the meeting. I sent them to Stephanie and Vasu yesterday, and I hope Stephanie will just forward them to folks. And if you haven't seen them, Jesse, I should send them to you as well. But yeah, I'd be interested to hear what you guys talked about. I haven't. I've been, as you may have heard, busy uh, with family emergency. And uh, oh, I didn't. I'm sorry to hear um, that. 
Yeah. yeah and I uh, have been rather preoccupied for the last 10 days with that. I just got my head out of the sand yesterday. So um, <laughs> uh, I have not had a chance to do much more with it other than send that package to um, Stephanie. And, right. and well, yeah, and I'm happy to pick up the ball on that one as well, if, right. if, if, um, if that makes sense. So the, Stephanie, do you want to jump in or you? I'm sorry, I'm going to backtrack just a little bit. I wanted to okay. know if you want to schedule the um, transportation and pace updates for the next meeting as neither Stella or Don are here. Do you want those to carry over to the next meeting? Sure, sure. And, and would, would it make sense? Do we reach out to Stella and Don and say, these were rescheduled. Sure. Yeah, I, I think yes, you can easily do that, and it will um, show up on the agenda. But Great. I can let them know ahead of time. Yeah, yeah please no, just no. push the heat pump and what was the other one up? Uh, solar bylaw, I think, up then uh, uh, a meeting. Don't try to do all four of them at once. Yeah, no, I wasn't. I was going to move them off to the next one after that. It's just going to push the other two back a bit. Awesome. Okay, the specialized stretch codes. So I think the, the recap is, I mean, just sort of step-by-step step as far as the conversations that have been had. We had the first meeting with uh, Rob Mora and David Skavitz, where they were suggesting that we don't rush it too much and sort of like find a, the right time for this to coincide with um, other code updates, et cetera. And then we as a group said, let's do this as quickly as possible. And looking at that kind of quickly as, and which now I believe um, still coincides very much with their expectations. So they're, I think I would say supportive on board and will endorse what we are doing with and and so what i'd like to do is maybe Lori, if i can take over that presentation and send a draft to stephanie to review with them and then they can formally say what you're saying makes sense the timeline of it and and just so you guys know the one there's really one thing that they're seeing as an issue and i don't think this affects the timeline but just so we all know this they're seeing issues with kind of equipment and systems that are being required, particularly electric um, equipment, you know, upgrading services and buildings to be more electric and long lead times. And, and they don't want this to put an undue onus on, on, on folks and, and potentially even steer them away from the electric options. Um, that was their feedback. It sounds to me like this, like this is going to get kick off in July, 2024. That's my guess. And the reason is the, the quickest, if the town council votes to do this, the quickest it would take effect is six months. It's either six months or a year. That's kind of, and so if they, it doesn't seem likely that that vote could happen before July. Um, therefore, six months from past July is past January. And then once we pass January 1, the suggestion is to wait until July 1, 2024. If there's a way that we can get this to go January 1, 2024 to sort of take effect, I think that would be great. Um, but I'll, I, I think I'm, I'm happy to kind of dig into that some more and see. Um, am I saying this, this makes sense? I'm seeing a lot of confused faces. I think it makes sense. Um, I'm still in favor of <clears throat> pushing ahead um, and seeing if we can um, get it on the council agenda in June. Yeah, so we could we could we could look to do that, which could be just a very simple letter. Hey, 
will you guys vote to do this this in June with the goal of starting in 2024? So January 1, 2024. And if not, we can also take the work that Lori's done. It's, I don't know if you've seen this, but she's got a short PowerPoint that's kind of set up to be just kind of edited a little bit, tweaked out. So then you present if 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 the council needs or wants sort of Q&A or questions or I don't want to say convincing, but they want to see a pitch in some ways to support it, to make which could make it simpler and easier for them to vote in approval and sort of hand it to them some of the thinking so they don't have to go and do the research themselves. Um, I think most of that work is done. So I think we could be ready to do that at any moment. I mean, I think I could I could give that presentation. Lori, Lori, I think could give that presentation. She gave a great job at the last meeting, but I'm happy to do it as well. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, I, I definitely think you should do it, Jesse, since you're the guy who knows the building community way better than I do. <laughs> um, and I also think that one thing we could consider is sending just sending them the link to the DOER presentation. Now, the first half of it is all in the stretch code, and they might be interested in that too. I don't know the uh, specialized the new updated stretch code, but um, it does have everything in it. Um, finally, one other thing is I noticed that some people on the BEA listserv have been asking if there are folks who can be available to either give the presentation or answer questions at different community organizations. And I haven't seen a yes answer to that, but it might be interesting. I wouldn't mind sending a note to the list, seeing if somebody's actually willing to do that. If there's, if there are people out there who are happy to, you know, be in the audience, even just to answer the questions. Um, I don't know if that's necessary or not, but. So why don't, did, Stephanie, did, did Vasu already send a letter to, to Lynn? Or no, who's the president? Is Lynn still the president? Lynn, Lynn Griesmer is the council president. And yeah. yes, I do believe he did actually um, a few months ago send a letter about this. And I know that this topic has come up with the council, I believe. Um, Anna has, or Anna has brought that up with the council. So um, what my suggestion was is, you know, maybe Jesse and or, or Lori reaching out to Anna to sort of check in to see where they are with their process, because I know she brought it up, but I don't know if it's moving towards trying to get them towards a vote in June. In June, I'm not sure. So it's worth connecting with her. And I, I could also, reach out on your behalf just to ask. No, I'll do that. I, I'd be happy to do that. L Lori, if you want to formally pass this off, I, and yeah, I, I'm if, happy to take this on. I think, Jesse, if you want to take that on, that's great. And I think that um, I agree. The thing to do is to follow up and find out if it's already on their agenda. And uh, if it isn't, to try to get it on their agenda for a specific meeting that we could then have that presentation ready for, you could give it, and maybe we could even find somebody else to be in the audience to help out if we need help. Um, Great. I'll let you decide, you know, you can, I guess, let me know, I think offline, if you want me to write to someone at BEA, see if there's anybody else who can help with this. I don't know if they'll answer affirmatively or not, but might be worth asking. But once we, we should have a date first, I think. Yeah, all right, I will, I will reach out to Anna. Okay, great, thank you. Awesome. Um, I would suggest, I don't know um, if they're on a second or third, you know, first and third, second and fourth Mondays, but if it's next week and there's a chance of getting an initial um, vote, I think they have to vote twice on everything. So... Um, it's time relevant, um, and and the agenda gets set on Thursdays, I believe. Yeah, so that they meet on Monday, the June twelfth, and the meeting packet has already been posted for that. Um, it's so. possible. It's possible that a counselor can bring up um, something as, you know, I don't know. 
But why, why don't we just try to officially get it on the calendar for the one after that, which is two weeks later? Is that right? I won't. I won't be here for that. I'll be on vacation. But I think that would be great. And then we'll do it again two weeks after that if it has to be on the agenda twice. Is that June? Twenty, June yeah. There's a, there's a June twenty sixth meeting and a July seventeenth meeting. So maybe let me. I'm going to defer to. Uh, uh, and let her advise on how we can do it. I don't want to pretend to know what they do or don't have time for right now. That sounds great. Just let us know. Awesome. Yeah, I will report back. Um, okay. Anything else on that topic that anyone wants to add in there? It's exciting and um, very significant. Um, the more towns that do it, the faster we're going to meet our goals. So I'm glad that we're pushing for Amherst to do it as soon as we can. I like it. Good. That's great. Um, uh, number six, review and vote. Letter to new DPU commissioners, Rose. I haven't done anything on it. Sorry. No worries. It's, um, you know, let, let's let the council focus on the specialized stretch code, get that through. Yeah. Great. That's, yeah. And that was, that was a lot of what we talked about in the previous meetings that I think you weren't at, but that was, was sort of our consensus as a group. It's like, let's, one thing. Um, annual report and then, and then after that's in place the idea would be then we would have some leverage to be able to write such a letter you know saying you know have something to show for it that we are on board with this and right get your house in, order. in these other First. ways as well yeah that's right um annual report was that was sent out to everyone i would just say maybe this take this as a reminder to make comments and send them back to stephanie and vasu uh, is anything else to, to that gets said on that? I've agreed to write a section on the regional and state level. So oh, great. I'll do that. When um, I think, yeah, I think Basu said to have the next meeting be a, a you know, fruitful, this needs to be to him by a certain date. Do you know what it is? Is that in the minutes? Um, I'm just going to look for the email. Don't remember seeing it in the minutes. Could be wrong about that. Basu will distribute and ask for focus area leaders to provide input in about three weeks about three weeks from May 25th. So my little week calculator here, May 25th. Next week. Three week. weeks would be June 15th. Yeah. So I'd say end of next week. He said he wants, yeah, he said he wants it by the 16th. Um, he's going to work on it over the weekend of the 17th and 18th. And um, present it to the ECAC on the 21st, which is his last meeting. Oh. And he gave everyone a reminder, and I'll, I'll just read them. Um, Andre, you just mentioned your, he said, complete section two. Um, Lori, complete section three. Duane, section four. And Stella, who's not here, would be section five. And Don, who's also not here, would be section six. But he did send it to everybody on the 28th. So I can re I can forward this message again just as a reminder. It'd probably be a good idea to remind the other folks as well who are not mm -hmm. here. Was, yep. was there anything in that email that suggested sort of the level of detail or, or length that he's looking for? Um, let's see. I don't think, I mean, I think he just wanted you to give updates. I, I think, um, 
the idea is just to give the information that you have. I, I don't think it's any specified length. You know, I think it's always probably good to be as succinct as you can. As chair of today's meeting, I'm directing you to make it as <laughs> short as possible. Exactly. That's, that's the guidance I'm looking for. <laughs> make it the link uh, you would want to read. Yes, short and sweet. Can, can I ask, um, what do you think? Does the specialized stretch code fit into the regional and state level? Yeah. Like so. are, are implementing state level opportunities? Yeah. Or are there too many things that are like that? Like every grant that we have? I mean, yeah, regional, state, local. I mean, that's local. The implementation is local because it's a town by town, but I feel like that could be a single sentence in your piece, Sandra. Okay. Um, awesome. Steve, are you prepared to discuss rental housing bylaw? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was a bit of a surprise to see it uh, there. I know <laughs> Laura had brought up the idea, and I think the general thought at this stage would be kind of regrouping and see what we, if we might want to take on the rental housing energy efficiency um, as a major effort uh, in the near future. Um, <clears throat> For those of you who, well, just a brief, brief recap, we worked on that quite a bit in the last two years. Um, we tried to get a bunch of data from the town to understand better the, rent, the rental housing stock. Um, and we have some of that data. Uh, we have some interesting data on the distribution of the rental stock between single family, two family, multifamily, a little bit of information about the age of the housing. But beyond that, the details get kind of mixed up um, because the property card information um, and the rental registration information are, are in different universes. Um, nonetheless, we did pull together some recommendations that we had initially included in the town council's revised rental registration bylaw, um, but those got pulled a um, couple months ago before that rental bylaw went forward. Um, those suggestions that we had in that draft bylaw were largely, well, I think there are two, if I remember right, two main things. One is to get more information as part of the rental registration, more information on the age of the house, the type of appliances, um, information about insulation, that sort of thing um, to build a database so we could better understand the rental housing stock. And then we also slipped in a request or a requirement, I guess, that for getting a rental re rental permit would require getting a mass save inspection every five years or something like that. Um, those ideas, yeah, as I said, got, got nixed. There was some feedback from, um, property owners that they were uh, too onerous or too difficult to do. So the council dropped those. Um, I haven't had time to really get back into it. And I would suggest that if we choose to take on this as a mission that we get um, kind of, yeah, get a critical mass of energetic people to figure out what to do next and shepherd it through all the hoops that will need to be jumped through. Yeah, I, I, I'll say that this is a good topic. This is an important one because we, um, I think one of the reasons we identified this and that's important and that Steve took it on it was that it, it, ha it's a, it has co-benefits, has the, the good co-benefits as far as it's not just about carbon, it's about Im improving uh, living conditions right and so 
And there's also, and given the amount of work that's already been done, I would say just maybe for the minutes to say that, to, to identify that this is an important topic and we do want to pick it back up again. And so to agree with, <laughs> to agree with Steve that get a critical mass and do it as a team um, and makes sense. I, I think it's a good one. To, to jump back on when the time is right. One of the things that we didn't get to include was the um, the, the local renters. Uh, the grant came through. Um, it took the, was that Empower grant? Is that the right um, name, Stephanie? That did come through. Yes. It is work that the community, as I understand from Stephanie's recent reports, the community is organizing and working to begin to form some kind of a renters advocacy group. I can give an update on that, Steve, on my, That'd be great. Um, my updates. Okay, in your updates in a few minutes, yep. sure. And I'm sorry, I'm having an issue with my eyes. Sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so I think that would be a great improvement for a future effort on rental housing would be to work with the renters and hopefully with this group that the Empower grant has empowered. Um, that was something that we did not weren't able to do last time because the the grant took an awfully long time to get awarded, and then um, all the paperwork signed. And I think the group is still getting themselves organized. Or, or so hopefully, if we take this on, then that's a group that we could work with uh, more closely this time. We would have, you have to figure to... out sort of what vehicle we would use to try to get these energy efficiency improvements um, codified. Um, I guess there's two choices, just kind of thinking off the top of my head. One would be the carrot approach, where we continue to add, um, highlight incentives that are available, like the PACE program or other incentives like Mass Save, um, or we try to get something ultimately perhaps passed by the town that would require some energy efficiency standards for rental housing. Now that reminds me, I, there was, there is, was, I think there's an effort um, from some of the statewide legislation to develop a committee has been studying a clean, clean heat initiative. Clean some heat. Clean heat standard. Clean heat standard. Okay. And I, as I understand, I think there was a commission that has studied that and maybe they've done a report. Um, and that might influence rental housing. Oh, there is a, so there is also, I think, a provision in that um, to redevelop statewide reporting standards for large buildings across Massachusetts. And that's an under development in one of the state agencies. And off the top of my head, it was it was going to be large buildings greater than 150,000 square feet or mm -hmm. not sure. um, and that would probably use the EPA energy um, por portfolio manager as a platform where the building owners or managers would have to report their energy through that. Uh, although the utility uh, companies would be obligated to provide the, the aggregated utility information through that platform. But that, that won't affect most buildings. That's true. That won't affect. I don't know what size they would end up and whether any of the larger apartment complexes would possibly fall under that. I, I kind of doubt it. I don't think it's intended for rental housing. No. Um, and certainly not developments that have multiple units, which is how they pretty much all are. Yeah, yeah. That's the new I buildings. I guess yeah. I had a hope of not really knowing much about it. That if this um, portfolio manager, the EPA portfolio manager system gets adopted more widely, then maybe that gives us some leverage to within town to require mm -hmm. smaller buildings um, and rental properties to also use that. Um, that system. I think that we would have to, you know, PACE and Mass Save are not carrots. They're, <laughs> they're 
a lot to deal with. Um, useful, but, um, you know, a real carrot would have to either give landlords um, some publicity or actual support in the form of, you know, grants or something. <clears throat> yes. <laughs> that's that's part of the, 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 the tough nut to crack is how how much support to provide. Yeah. And how much backed up by some sort of sticks. Um, so I guess my in summary, there there are some movements that are going on in the state level that might kind of provide some support for energy efficiency, improving energy efficiency of rental units. Um, and it's probably maybe this fall would be a time for a, a team from ECAC to look into that again. That's what I was thinking the fall. I think when we do this, I'm in distress today, and I think probably you guys might be too, if you've been looking at the news. Um, one of the things we might try to do every time we bring this up at town council or anywhere is like, if you look at the, I'm gonna, I'm gonna can I share my screen with you? I just wanna show you what the front page of the New York Times looks like right now. This is why we need everything we can possibly get, right? Because these fires that are going on right now are a direct result of climate change. We never had arboreal fires in Canada <laughs> until a few years ago. And now this is what they're doing just a few years in to the beginning of these sorts of fires. It's gonna get worse. Washington Post is no better. The entire East Coast is shrouded like this. We were shrouded yesterday. I don't know if you guys saw the ash falling. I saw ash falling in East Hampton yesterday. Wow. Any rate, I'll stop there, but I, I just wanted to point out that maybe when we talk about carrots and sticks, we should also talk about just bringing a little reality into every discussion with pictures like that. You know, we don't do everything we can do. This is, this is where we are and it's gonna get worse. I guess, um, yeah. I mean, it seems like our hands are a bit tied in terms of doing um, yeah. anything um, without, you know, part of it could be proposals to develop some carrots <laughs> by, by the town to, for example, give a seal of approval uh, to um, renters um, that demonstrate energy efficient buildings um, that could be uh, marketed. Obviously, that's going to take effort <laughs> um, and, and, and sustained effort and, and uh, human resources to implement something like that. Um, I'm also thinking there could be an effort that's even not town driven. It could be ECAC or something is, is to educate consumers, uh, renters to um, ask, uh, ask, always ask your prospective tenant um to see an energy bill or what what's been what's been the energy uh what's the energy cost going to be for me um and to use that as part of their um negotiations as well as comparative shopping but those take effort too stephanie i've talked to jesse about this a little bit um and it just seems to me that there needs to be more consistent messaging about conservation and not using energy. I feel like I grew up at a time where um, energy conservation was just a huge issue and people were really motivated and it had an impact. And I feel like we've kind of lost that messaging. It feels like it's sort of caught up more in technology as a solution. And I just feel like that's not accurate, nor is it really working, or is it going to work? So I just feel again that people need to know that they need to stop um, using energy as much as they normally do. I mean, we've just come to be so much about convenience 
um, that I think we've forgotten some of those things, those like basic messaging about, you know, turning off your lights, unplugging all your appliances, you know, those are simple things and they seem, they almost seem kind of silly, but collectively that makes a huge difference. And I think I've got friends who are so smart, so concerned, and I go to their houses and all their lights are on, <laughs> you know, and their kids are already moved out of the house and it's just two of them. I feel like those, those are the messages we need to continue to get out there because even the people who know and are concerned sometimes just kind of forget. Maybe we yeah. could uh, give a, a bulk rate discount on motion detector light switches. Mm -hmm. and that is not a bad idea. <laughs> we, we have found that sim simple um, energy mon monitoring systems that show you Little little thing that sits on the kitchen counter and shows you how, what your fridge uses, what your lights use, you know, et cetera. When you can see it, you you turn it down. That that type of thing um, has hit, has a really good feedback loop, particularly in campus settings, um, but also in households. But oftentimes, the type of person that buys that device is someone that is already looking. They want to. They want to turn it down. Yeah, no, it's huge. I, I think it's important. It's a really important piece of the puzzle. Is um, well, maybe making those devices available. You know, maybe having an incentive program where we're actually giving them to people. Well, um, I mean, yeah, you go to the you go to the the transfer station, and those compost bins, which online were hundreds of dollars, are thirty five dollars. Mm -hmm. It's a incredible deal. Yep. Um, yeah, so if the town has that ability to buy a thousand of the right device, although again, here we are buying a <laughs> buying a solution. Yeah, right. <laughs> but <laughs> you know, but it's a reminder, you know, like you said, it can be a motivator. Yeah. So when we dive back into this, there are a, quite a bit of resources available to look at how other communities have done this. Um RMI has Got a whole team working on this that's continuing to be active. Um, so there, I think there can be help from outside the town that we can look at for good ideas and what other communities have done successfully. Um, yeah, well, I'll say. I think maybe to, to wrap this up, thank you, Lori, for sort of reminding us why we're sitting here. Um, and Stephanie for for reminding us of a of an often that sort of critical piece. It's not um that we we lose track of we, the shiny things keep distract us. Um I'm looking at the list here and Laura Drucker has a discussion of prioritized solar siting um, that I think is probably related to our public comment. And I think without Laura, we probably should not embark on that conversation. And so I'll, Stephanie, staff updates, maybe start with the, the one relevant to, to Steve's comments. Sure. Sure. So um, I've been working now with um, a resident group uh, that was basically pulled together by Family Outreach of Amherst on conducting a, a rental survey. And it's been a bit slow going. Um, it is, um, there is one individual who is the um, sort of the um, the coordinator of all the community captains, uh, but there's been some challenges with folks starting, then not following through with getting the survey done. There's a few individuals who have them completed, <laughs> some who have them almost completed, um, and then some who haven't even started. And they've had a few weeks now with all of the materials. And what they're doing is they're, um, these people have been identified at their complexes that they live at. So they're doing outreach at their complex. 
Um, there is supposed to be, a, or there are supposed to be a few community meetings where people can come to the community meeting to fill out the survey. Um, I think, again, those haven't been scheduled yet, but um, it's, like I said, it's been just a little bit, you know, they. it took a while just to sort of get it all up and running. I'm not part of the meetings. This is done entirely by the renters. Um, there are some folks with um, English is not their primary language. So our um, community coordinator is someone who's bilingual and who's been kind of overseeing uh, that work. So we do keep in touch regularly, but I would just say it's slower. It's moving forward, but it's slower than we would have liked. And again, I want to remind you that, you know, I've had little to do with the survey other than sort of giving some feedback and helping them sort of consolidate some of it. Um, they've been working more directly with family outreach on all of this. Um, the funding is primarily going to family outreach. So um, it is moving forward, but I don't have a whole lot more I can say at this time. I'm hoping that they can at least finish the surveys. Our next meeting is going to be on the 15th. Um, We've been meeting, well, we've been trying to meet every week. It doesn't happen, but often, but, um, or regularly, but our next meeting is scheduled for the 15th. So I'm hoping that, um, I'm hoping that all those surveys that they had for um, the outreach to their individual complexes will be completed. So that's one thing. Um, the other thing I wanted to announce is that our fellows are here. They're wonderful. Um, it's a, uh, Caitlin Hart and Miguel gothers rees and Caitlin is working on the greenhouse gas emissions inventory. Miguel is working on the building inventory. Um, you know, a little, of a little bit of a bumpy start in getting their workstations set up and them having the access that they, they, they needed. But today was, they started on Monday. Today was the first day that they really had access to the network. I provided them with some hard copies of items to sort of get them started. But um, Today was the first day that they were both um, getting into the network and the data that we have and really just going at it. And I think they're they're really wonderful. They're very smart. They're really eager to do this work. Uh, they will probably, I'll probably ask to have them scheduled for the July 5th agenda so that you can meet them. I'd like you to meet them and to be able to ask them a few questions and for them to give you an, a quick update on um, on the work that they're doing. So that should be for July 5th. Um, and then let's see, as some of you know, I don't know if all of you were aware or there, but last night we had our community, uh, intermunicipal community presentation on the Valley Green Energy Community Choice Aggregation. We had 54 attendees, uh, 52 throughout pretty much the entire meeting. Great questions. Our consultants were very impressed with the caliber of questions that we received. Some people clearly had industry knowledge, <laughs> for sure. Um, so they asked some really tough questions, one of which, and I was really impressed that anyone could ask a question that Paul Gromer could not answer. <laughs> that was very impressive. Um, but, you know, Paul, um, really great at really sort of really making the um, information very accessible and clear. Both he and Marlena did a fantastic job, um, but they this is what they do. They're really, really good at it. And I feel like we're super lucky um, to have them as our consultants. So really thankful that they're with us. So that happened. Um, the community comment period is for 30 days, which started June 1st. It ends June 30th. So again, if anybody is here or watching this at another time, we would really love for people to um, send us comments about becoming an aggregation, intermunicipal aggregation. Uh, the video is posted on the town's YouTube site so folks can see it. They can search for it by Town of Amherst YouTube and then Community Choice Aggregation or by the date of the session, which was June 6th. That's how they can access watching the video. Um, it will also be provided, I think, on our on our um, Valley Green Energy page as well. If it isn't already, it will be. But the YouTube is always the sort of go-to place to see these presentations. Definitely. Um, Could yeah. I just um, 
add on to what you said about CCA. Absolutely. Um, the kind of the, the comments all go to the Department of Public Utilities, which is where the decisions are made about what's going to be allowed in the aggregation and what's not. Um, and they'll come back to us, not ECAC, but the, the team working on it um, with questions and, um, and you know, suggestions about things that can't be done. Um, and so having public support for certain things um, in particular is, are, are, are very going to be very useful for us. Um, the particular ones that I can think of is that it's a joint aggregation and that um, that gives us an opportunity to um, increase our our possibilities for uh, making a difference and that most important is that um, this is going to the goal is to reduce emissions and to increase our um, the clean energy that comes into town um, via the mechanisms that exist um, and that is not every aggregation's goal. And so the fact that that is our goal, um, it's very important to show public support for. Yes, as um, uh, Marlena pointed out, they are, the DPU looks very, very carefully at all of the materials that are submitted, which may be in part why it's taking such a long time because it's quite a, quite a huge packet that's submitted. And especially this one being three communities, it'll be pretty hefty um, of, a, of an application package for review and everything is included, every comment. It, so far, anything that any of the three communities have received in terms of any feedback that's even remotely related um, is, been, is being sent to the consultant for them to compile, so. Um, Dwayne, you had a question. Um, yeah, uh, just wondering, are we too close to the town itself to um, possibly put in a comment from ECAC, given that it's a, an important part of our CARP? I don't see why not. I mean, you can certainly, even as individuals, it may even be strength in sort of clarity of what you're looking for and each person submitting a comment. So you could do it as a committee, but it might make it even go further. Yeah, I mean, I'm residents. saying in addition to individual comments, but. I think you could do it either way. I think whatever comments we receive, whatever kind of support we receive, I mean, I think what you would want to be clear about, I mean, it's obvious to us, but you just want to be clear that you're a committee of resident members, you know, so make sure that, you know, so that that's clearly stated that you're all residents of Amherst. And as a committee, whatever it is you feel that you, how you want to state or support it. Yeah, I, I guess the question then for ECAC is whether we would want to put in a joint comment, not to preclude us from putting in individual. So, individual Dwayne, would you want to, you, would you want to draft, could you draft that for our next meeting? Well, that was my fear by when I raised my hand. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I, I wasn't volunteering, but um, uh, I could, um, unless uh, Andra feels like she's in a good position to do that or, and would want to do that, being even closer to it. What, if the period ends on the 30th, where, how do these comments go to the DPU? So they, each community is collecting comments, but also the consultant is collecting comments as well. So there's, you you would get them to the town specifically. You can get them to me. Comments yeah. go through me, and then I get them to the consultant. But we also have a page set up. Um, I I think we had it set up on Engage Amherst, or the we have a Valley Green Energy page, um, and there's uh, all of the ways in which you can provide comment are listed on the Valley Green Energy page on the town's website. 
and there should be a link on the main page. There's also an article as well. Um, I think that having um, an ECAC comment is not going to add that much. I, I, I think that our individual um, comments are going to have more weight with DPU and the only audience is the DPU for this because we know the town wants to do it. Um, so I, I wouldn't. I see. So the comments are more to uh, um, assure the town that the residents want it, not so much the DPU. No, <laughs> no, no. The DPU. No, yeah, it, the opposite. It, it's yeah, the exactly. Opposite. It's just the opposite. It's the opposite. The, the town already has committed and, and it's the DPU that needs to know that the people, customers. Okay, not not the uh, the town itself or the or the yeah. committees of the town. Okay, I, I get that. So yeah. Yeah, and I think that's yeah. why I was saying I think individual letters are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I see that. Are okay. definitely more effective than yeah. just the committee. And again, you could do both, but I think you know you might yeah. as well just send individual letters. Yeah. So um, as a, as an individual, a letter just saying. I'm excited. I want to participate. That is sufficient. Correct. Okay. Well, I think it's. I but, and I'm particularly excited about the intermunicipality right. and mm -hmm. about leveraging this to for emissions reductions. Right. And when I go to Valley Green Energy Working Group, Stephanie, you're the contact. So is it yes. just an email to you? Please Correct. forward to DPU. Yeah, you just you just. Could write letter support. You don't have to tell me. As long as it's a letter of support, you don't have to write forward. I, I know what it's for. <laughs> so you just basically letter of support for Valley Green Energy. Is that's I think that's how I would title it. Letter of support for Valley Green Energy. Just state it. And if there's specific things that you're looking for, like, you know, um, I think Marlena was talking about sort of things like maybe some people want some more investment in wind or, you know, you could, you can be more specific about how you want, um, what you want the, the aggregation to sort of focus on in terms of renewables. So you can say that. Great. So just a straight up email. Form. Just a straight up email works. That's totally fine. Again, all I'm doing is they come into me and I'm just shooting them to the consultant and I am also keeping my own folder of, of them. So we have backup of where they are. And the subject line does have to include Valley Green Energy, <laughs> the name of our aggregation. Yep. All right, all of you guys out there in the public, both of you, don't forget to send your email too. <laughs> Or am I not? I'm not allowed to tell anyone to do anything on this group. Sorry. <laughs> if you would that. like, yes. Okay. If you would like, Just thank give you. Give Jesse a little power and boy. <laughs> yeah, I told you guys. <laughs> um, um, that's awesome. all I have. So I think I've I've given most of my update. Um, Laura, nice to see you. Hi. You are on the agenda for a discussion of prioritized solar siting. You, you do not, I'm not necessarily expecting that to happen. I'm in charge of running the meeting today. If you haven't noticed, I'm having way too much fun doing it. Um, do you wanna do anything with that or postpone? Yeah, no, I can just start a quick discussion here because um, it'd be beneficial to, um, I was just taking some notes here um, to get the conversation started. So this is this is stemming from the fact that I think even if within the town we may have disagreements on solar on land, there's very clear agreement that we want solar on parking lots, that we want solar on buildings, that we want solar on brownfield type sites. Um, so I think in the interest of our rapidly warming climate, it would be helpful if maybe we focus some of our energy across town on actually developing things instead of trying to figure out what we don't want to develop. So um, 
and I'd be interested in brainstorming with this group what ECAC's role might be. Um, a few ideas that have popped into my head. One, of course, being parking lots. So a couple, a couple things have happened recently. Most importantly, I think, is the change to the tax credit that means that no longer it, non entities that don't pay taxes or that are nonprofit used to not be able to access the tax, the 30% tax credit. And now that's that's not true anymore. So that means that the town can access it. That means that the higher ed institutions probably have more capabilities of accessing it. That also means like faith-based institutions, churches and stuff, you know, they might be able to access it more. So we may want to figure out how to communicate that to some of these folks that maybe have looked in the past and determined it was too expensive or not viable for them. Um, at the town level, you know, we talked about parking lots and I know we've done some studies, Stephanie, and, and I'm forgetting all of them, but something that we did at the college was we did a, did a call for proposals to develop all of the parking lots. And of course they never did it, but like, because one parking lot is not going to be vi like going to be economically viable for a developer, but if we could give them three parking lots or four parking lots, they might be interested in it. Um, so just throwing that out there as something to consider whether we want to try to see the viability of that for some of the parking lots that we know are not going to be changing anytime soon. Um, the other thought I had so that's one idea, the parking lot issue, or does two ideas, sort of getting the word out about the tax change to some of our faith-based institutions, our higher ed institutions, and everybody that maybe wasn't eligible for the tax credit before, thinking about the parking lot situation. Um, the other two ideas I have is that, you know, Amherst, we're sort of limited in Amherst in terms of large warehouses, large facilities, um, but we have a ton in Hadley. We have a ton in our big box stores. We have some in Hadley. We have lots of places in South Deerfield, East Hampton. There's a lot of places in our region where maybe there's a, a there's an opportunity to, can't, to, to launch a campaign together across the region to try to leverage some of the work that, you know, the Environment America group has done on warehouse solar, sort of trying to get um, push for some of that development. And it wouldn't be in Amherst, but it would of course green our grid in Massachusetts and it would be beneficial to our overarching goal. And then the last point, and this is actually um, influenced by one of the posters I saw at the UMass event from one of Dwayne's students, I think, or Dwayne, your name was on the poster <laughs> about um, community, solar and how, um, you know, I think your students kind of showed that like a lot of low income people aren't accessing community solar as much as they should be. And is there something that we can do there as well within Amherst? So I'll pause there. Stephanie, I see your hand up. Um, yeah, I just wanted to point out that I think um, in terms of um, reports, I think the Cadmus report goes into some very specific sites in more detail. And I think that's a good place to really start. And I know that there's, you know, that's been distributed here. I know there's some looking, some investigation of um, maybe at least a parking canopy at the school, um, one of the schools. So I know that there's at least discussion around it, but I think getting sort of right behind those very specific sites that have already been investigated is a really good place to start. And Stephanie, how does it work? So like, would we, so what, what I would have done when I was with the college is I would have taken that report and I would have put out a call for interest to solar de to, to different developers and say hey here's some I here's some idea come back to us with some ideas on how you might build solar on these sites like is that something the town can do or do you have to go through a different process um it's uh it's similar i mean i think we've um 
I think we are looking in terms of um, maybe getting some ideas from uh, some developers on uh, like a canopy, like I said, a school canopy development. Um, so we would look at consultants and we would ask them to sort of give us some quotes on what they think that might be. So it's a similar, it's a similar process. Um, but in terms of, you know, we, we are, you know, very much, and I don't know with the private institutions, it may not be the same, but we are definitely obligated to go out to bid over a certain threshold, which a parking canopy absolutely would be. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, we'd have to go out to bid for a project, but we'd, you know, but we develop the scope and all of that, you know, ahead of time. So, I mean, I feel like those are the kinds of things where, and, you know, various members, this committee has been tapped for those things. It's just that you're not all tapped at one time. Um, Steve helped with, you know, with developing the um, RFP for the Climate Action Plan. Dwayne's been very instrumental with helping out with the um, solar assessment. So at various times, Lori's been helping with the um, heat pump, developing heat pump program. So, you know, we tap you at various times. It's not always like the entire committee, but you all are being tapped for your expertise and then bringing it back to the group. So I feel like that's a, I'm maybe getting off point here, but I think um, that's a good place to start. And that process is similar. It's a similar process. And I, like I said, I think it's beginning. The thing about, you know, with the town is a lot of times things sort of start in the finance realm. Sean Mangano is very involved when there's a list of capital projects. Sean's really kind of on top of that. So, you know, I know he's looking at that Cadmus report, but that's why I'm thinking that if you all want to get behind that and advocate for specific projects to start moving forward, that would be helpful. Yeah, that's helpful. Yeah, I'm just thinking maybe it's, you know, instead of us advocating for specific projects, it's us advocating for as much solar as we could get and then having a developer tell us like where, because if we do maybe two more than, I guess it just depends on the developer and the consultant, but it could be that there's a um, economics of scale where if we had a couple sites together, um, not next next to each other, of course, but like if they came in and did a couple sites, they would, um, it would be more beneficial to all involved. But um, see, well, Jesse, I'm taking over your job now. But Lori, <laughs> Jesse, and <Lori>. Dwayne here. <laughs> um, yeah, I just had a, a question in the comment, which is with a new CCA in place. Um, I think we also need to be coordinating with that, right? Because isn't part of the idea there for that group to ultimately develop some of its own? Yeah, but that's going to be down the road. I mean, okay. I think, right, you don't want to wait because that could be a couple of years Agreed. before okay. that's really moving Agreed. along. I, you've got some reports now, you've got some opportunities now, okay. I wouldn't wait. It just means that we could sort of expand. There'll be more opportunity in the future is how I like to look at it. Okay, good. Thanks. And Dwayne, I know you had your hand up. Um, I think Jesse was Jessie. first. But. Okay, sorry. Jesse, you're chairing. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Dwayne. Okay, I was just going to, um, and, and let me just say, I, I really appreciate this conversation. I think we should con continue this uh, 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 for many, many meetings to sort of see how we can um, help move solar forward. Um, uh, and, and particularly focusing on areas that are not necessarily controversial, if you will. I guess what I would maybe helpful to Laura and Stephanie, you can opine on this as well, but I think um, we can, the Cadmus uh, survey of projects, um, I think is is somewhat, could be looked at it independently and separate from, Laura, what you were saying more in terms of uh, of other sites, including other towns, but other uh, parking lots and, and so forth of, of uh, faith community or, or um, private entities within the town because the, the Cadmus set of a portfolio of projects were all on municipally owned property, uh, which um, to some extent makes it, um, I think a different different um, process in terms of trying to move those projects forward compared to um, a, a whole another portfolio of projects that might be non, not, not municipally controlled. Um, so I just wanted to make that distinction between the two.
and I'll just throw in and make that sort of plug for thinking about how how this dovetails with um, routine maintenance and particularly re-roofing projects in the town, which in an ideal world, a re-roofing means adding insulation, adding structural support that the new insulation and solar would demand and then adding solar. So I, I just made any re-roofing project more expensive, but dramatically increased the benefit um, to whoever owns that building, whether it's the town or anyone else. Um, I'm thinking about the high school and the middle school. At some point, they're going to need new roofs, and we can't put solar on those buildings, you know, three years before a roof needs to be replaced. But we can also say that a, a roof with solar on it, the, the underlaying roof will last far longer because it's not in the sun. Um, incredible how much longer these roofs last once they're protected by PV. So um, a lot of positives there. So it's the opportunity of re-roofing. Alrighty. Um, and Laura, just so you know, and if you do, when you're back on YouTube watching the first half of the meeting later tonight, um, our first public comment was very much in line with what you're saying, sort of like a, a pitch for protecting natural spaces, but also this, we all agree on putting solar in disturbed areas. Um, so it's it's a great public comment that's worth, maybe worth sort of, it reinforces, I think, what you just said. Let's focus on what we all agree we want to do, not on what we want to argue about. Um, so putting, right, well, maybe Jesse, just to, to last point there, and then we want to move on, but like maybe putting us to Dwayne's point, putting the municipal owned properties aside for a second, what do we think would be a next step for kind of talking through with the community about this sort of campaign idea or about, you know, how do we reach out to the faith, faith-based communities? Um, would we, would we do a meeting? Would we like maybe, and maybe Andrew, Andrew, I'm looking to you as being more connected to Mothers Out Front and other groups. Like, is there a group that would take this on that we could support? Like, how might we try to mobilize folks? Because us, our group on its own is not going to be able to do it. But I think if we could mobilize with some other local groups, we might be able to come up with some ideas. Well, I mean, one of the things that we could do as a committee is to um, send out a letter to all of the faith communities that have buildings, um, letting them know about the new tax incentives available, um, and perhaps something like that to uh, other groups. So I, I think there is a role for ECAC. Um, I think that the other you know, grassroots organizations would be more helpful in um, reaching out to homeowners and perhaps the renters, which is something that we were talking about earlier in um, reference to energy efficiency, so. Great, thanks. Stephanie? Um, I, I love what Andra just said because I was thinking a similar thought is, you know, the education piece, and I think to Laura's comment earlier um, when you said, you know, these organizations don't necessarily know about this, that you all as a group are very respected in the community and you have the expertise and the knowledge base that could really help um, spread awareness about it. And I know it wouldn't be you alone, but if you created some kind of an outreach campaign, that's where we have some sustainability funds now that could sort of help with possibly materials, having a meeting, um, you know, working in conjunction with some of the other um, existing agencies within the town to really get some of this information out to those relevant folks who aren't aware. So 
I just wanted to say that, you know, we have some funding now. And having a very strategic campaign would be a great thing to think about. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll think more on this and maybe start to, to outline a little letter before the next meeting if I have the time. Awesome. We did staff updates, ECAC member updates. Um, I'd like to um, go first. Um, I've let Stephanie and Laurie and Basu know that I'm going to be leaving the committee. Um, I need to put my energies into um, the more state and regional efforts um, and taking some time off made me realize um, that I was doing too much um, and not good for my health and probably not good for all of the uh, entities that I had committed to. Um, and I also am open to staying on through the summer when it might be hard to get a quorum or, or until um, there are replacements for Vasu and I. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that's, Stephanie said, well, you know, terms kind of end in June, but, you know, on an interim, um, you know, in an interim way, I, I, I could do that. Um, and I think that we should put on the agenda for the next meeting, um, especially appreciation for Vasu for his chairship, which he did an excellent job of. And that does not need to be my last meeting, so we can just focus on Vasu. <laughs> Thank Wow. Wayne? Yep, um, and uh, sorry to hear that, Andra, but appreciate you you joining us for uh, since as an, the part of the inaugural team members here. So, um, uh, but sad to see you go from this committee, but not not quite yet. So, um, it, just an announcement. It, it was in our packet, uh, but for the uh, Soda Bylaw Working Group meeting this Friday, uh, we have somewhat more of an educational uh, uh, meeting, if you will. Um, with interest amongst the working group, uh, particularly on dual use solar or agrivoltaics. Uh, and so we have a um, set of speakers for an hour and a half. This is this Friday uh, at 1130. Um, and uh, we have um, a speaker, Ethan Winter from um, uh, American Farmland Trust. Uh, who, uh, and AFT, American Farmland Trust, does a lot of work uh, on dual use around the country, or agrivoltaics, I should say. Uh, Jake Marley, uh, our um, own hometown uh, solar uh, dual use developer, uh, Hyperion Systems uh, out of, out of uh, uh, Amherst, uh, will speak about um, his experience with farmers and particularly on small scale agrivoltaics. Uh, and then uh, Jerry Polano from MDAR, Mass Department of Ag Resources, uh, will um, talk a bit about the state program and the rules and regulations. Um, and uh, so it'll be a, a, a combination of um, uh, comments, uh, maybe some formal presentations from the speakers, and then Q&A and discussion with the working group and with, with, the, um, with anybody. Uh, it's an open uh, more of an open educational thing like we've done with um, ECAC. Um, uh, so um, welcome anybody from uh, ECAC for sure um, to join in that. Um, the web link for the Solar Working Bylaw Working Group is um, um, is uh, on the town website. <laughs> Where I, I can it's also, it's also on the, the flyer. And it's on the flyer. Absolutely. It's on the flyer. Yes. That looks like a great event. Um, quick circle back, Andra, will you keep us posted on what we should be thinking about from the state, at the state level and the regional level? 
That would be great. Sure, I, I'd be happy to do that. Yeah, I mean, sometimes I, you know, I think you know, you'll know you know this group, you'll know what we're capable of or not capable of. And I feel like you'd be a great conduit to, to send us things that we might not, you know, we can be in Amherst. Keep keep us uh, keep us in mind. Um, all right. ECAC other ECAC member updates. I do, maybe I do have a question, a follow up question for Duane, and I don't think it's related specifically to um, dual use, but I'm wondering if it's come up at all in the in the solar working group discussions about the so, like I don't know how to say this in a way that's not gonna so some I mean private farmers can reap benefits from converting their land to solar and I get a little concerned with some of the the debate about that that doesn't include those people <laughs> um you know like what it is the financial driver for some farmers to maybe sell land for solar or to put solar on land so that they can collect some tax revenue for a set number of years um so they don't have to sell land like there's a, there's a lot of nuances to it that i think get like there was just an art like some article in the paper about Hadley and how it's all getting taken up. And it, it's like, well, those are people that own that land that are doing it for reasons that we may not fully understand or appreciate. So anyway, just wondering if that's a conversation to be had or if if we're bringing, bringing those folks into the discussion at all. Well, certainly for the um, forum on Friday, there's an outreach effort to um, uh, invite farmers and so forth and landowners to that discussion that being said you know friday in the middle of the day of the springtime and early summer is not a great time <laughs> for farmers to be on zoom uh but we'll see um if any are, are uh, in attendance um you know i would say that um uh and and obviously our working group meeting is uh they can provide input to us at any at any point um uh but yeah no these are the questions we're um grappling with uh, Laura, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, how do we, how do we, um, uh, accommodate, um, you know, the, the solar and ag is, is a complicated and nuanced <laughs> issue, as you know, um, uh, there's situations where farmers can make a, a clear case that, um, dedicating some of their land to solar will help maintain the rest of it in farming, uh, from a financial perspective. Uh, um, there are, um, you know, in, in some cases with farmland that's protected, there's limitations of what they can do in terms of how much solar they can put on their farmland. Uh, there are uh, lots of rules around agrivoltaics, which we'll delve into on Friday with regard to um, what conditions um, and 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 the the fact what conditions of of. Uh, 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 farm situations uh, are eligible for agrivoltaics uh, and what the restrictions are and the requirements of the farming to stay in farming and so forth. Um, but um, but yeah, so we're kind of um, looking at those issues and trade-offs of, of um, trying to preserve um, uh, farmland and food production as a vital part of Amherst as well. Um, also recognize that, that um, property owners have their have rights as well uh in terms of making determinations but um but yeah all those things are, are is sort of what we're trying to grapple with 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 the you know the blunt tool tool of zoning uh in our case there's other other rules and policies that might be appropriate here but um we're looking at it strictly from the zoning perspective that's helpful I just came across <clears throat> I just came across a report last night um, from the American Farmland Trust that it's um, titled "Potential Placement of Utility Scale Solar Installations on Agricultural Lands in the U.S. to 2040." Uh, put out just in November of 2022, so it's pretty new. Um, I haven't gotten all the way through it yet, 
They discuss a lot about the trends of solar development on farmlands um, and kind of their concerns about it. But what caught my eye is they have a outline of smart solar, and I haven't seen the whole part of it yet, but sort of guidelines for developing, achieving sustainable energy and food production. And so they have the smart solar SM superscript. I'm not sure what that means. Um, for guiding principles. Anyways, I'll, I will um, send this to Stephanie. To, if it looks good, I'll finish reading it tonight. And if it looks good, I'll send it to Stephanie to share with everybody. Um, That'd be useful. Uh, thanks. Yeah, I was, I was I, when I first started, honestly, it's like, oh, American Farmland Trust, we know what they're going to be thinking. But it turned out that no, that I think they're actually, you know, how do you integrate solar and farming in a way that benefits the farmers, food production, and and people around on other lands so it's um it's got yeah, that they're, they're, i mean aft is generally actually very not not i shouldn't say very but is uh, interested in agrivoltaics as a means to preserve farm farming yeah um, you know I, I i would caution um that farming in the u.s generally is is quite a bit different than farming in amherst and even massachusetts for that matter yeah. i mean utility scale um I think I don't know how they define utility scale, <laughs> but uh, it's probably beyond the size of farms we have here. But nonetheless, um, it um, uh, some of that could be very uh, useful to us. And that reminded me the um, one of the things that we'll be excited to see is in the GZA mapping product. <clears throat> I believe they'll be mapping out soils, important agricultural soils. And as that thought came up, I was going to ask Stephanie if there's any updates in the timeline for the web um, web based mapping tools to be available. Um, yeah, I have a there's a draft that um, Dwayne is part of the technical team is going to and Mike and I are going to meet hopefully early next week. Um, so and again, the soils layer is just the soils layer that exists that's been done. So it's not anything that the town has created a specific soils layer, just to be clear. That, yes, yes. That's all, but yes, it is, uh, and it is part, it is a, a layer that can be turned on and off. So maybe next week, is that sort of your tentative? Well, next oh. meeting, perhaps, not oh. next week, but next meeting. <laughs> so I'm gonna meet with Dwayne. We'll see, I mean, depending on, you know, Dwayne's feedback to Mike, um, you know, and if there are things he might wanna sort of tweak a little bit, um, and then we'll get it out to the two committees, both ECAC and the Solar Bylaw Working Group. Great. Thank you. Um, any other ECAC updates, announcements? Uh, okay. Next meeting's agenda is so. Next meeting is Vasu's last. Is that right? Correct. So, um, so a party for Vasu will be on the agenda, um, and a um, and maybe and I would assume the annual report. Putting that to bed. And then the updates for the transportation and pace. Yep. Yes. And I would be willing to guess that I, I that there might be a specialized code update given how mm -hmm. fast this ought to be moving. Um, hopefully I'll have an update on that. And you think we might have an update on transportation since we missed that this time? Yeah, that's what we said. Yeah. Those oh, the updates say... would be transportation and pace. Okay. Oh, you did say that. Sorry. Both. Yep. That's okay. My clacking of my keyboard was too noisy. <laughs> Super. Well, let's not overwhelm ourselves with agenda items. Public comment. Anybody? Uh, yay. 
What do we have? Uh, we have Martha. Martha, fantastic. And Eric. Go ahead, Martha. You can. Uh, Hi, I'm Martha Hanner. I uh, live in uh, District 5, South Amherst. I am a member of the Solar Bylaw Working Group, but of course, I speak as an individual. And so I want to say first that, you know, from listening to this whole discussion, I'm really impressed with how many different things you are all, you know, trying to focus on, you know, all the different aspects from the CARP and so on. And of course, what's striking is that each individual effort takes so much investment of time. And the real challenge is how do you move forward on any of them? Um, Stephanie, I think, works 36 to 40 hours out of every 24 day. <laughs> day that's my impression and the rest of you you know try your best uh and so that's certainly a big challenge um i wanted to comment on on a few individual things i wondered uh laurie and and, and jesse if is, is it possible to get a copy of the slides on the stretch code i think that by now they are they public accessible or Yeah, I think they they came in. We saw them last time. They came in recently. So step, I think that'll get Stephanie. That does that get posted? The last retroactively. The last now? meeting. They should be in the last meeting's packet. Um, yeah, so they were available. Yeah, I don't and know if they were in the packet because I only finished them like right before the meeting. Oh, okay. So um, let me. Is, you typically is, I try to include them, but um, if I didn't, I would include them the next time. Uh, I could include them next time. I could include them in the last packet, the one that was sent for the last packet. But did you revise it, Lori? Uh, I only took out the extra slides at the end, and there were still some questions. I didn't do a lot of revision. I don't think I did any revision. I mostly just took the slides that I showed last time and cut off the stuff at the end of the packet that I didn't show. It's taken, though, from the DOER presentation, and there's a really nice presentation on both specialized and the stretch code. That's the part I took out. I took out the updated stretch code part from the DOER and then added a couple of slides specifically relevant to Amherst. Do you have then a, a, a reference or a link to that presentation? I do, but I can't put it in the... Yeah, is that, I, that I can something? Send it I'll, I'll get it, Lori. If you just send whatever version you think is ready, I can um, I can put it in the next meeting packet and I can get it to Martha yeah. now. I, I sent that one to you uh, already earlier today, Stephanie. So no, uh, I did not see it. That. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, it was maybe an hour before the meeting. OK, yeah. so all right. So there's the most recent is sent today. Yeah. I'm just making a note to myself. And Martha, I can send that to you, and I'll just put it in your next ECAC packet. Yes. And um, then regarding the discussion of the um, parking lots and, and solar canopies, the niche report has a whole list of potential parking lots. That was the other uh, public report uh, and it has a whole list. Uh, and also it's interesting, the niche report uh, lists one specific 17 acre ground field that's off of route 116 across from Hampshire college i think it says that it might have been an old gas station or something and my impression is it's still owned by hampshire college and so steve i wondered whether there was uh had been any thoughts uh from the college as to whether that could be uh implemented for solar particularly now that nonprofits can get the uh, rebates i have thought about that i was I think that's where I learned that there was a brownfield there. And yes, there was a gas station right along 116, kind of opposite the Hampshire College admissions building. Mm -hmm. um, I think yeah. it was 20 plus years ago, a tank, an old gas tank was pulled. The site is being monitored. I don't think there's any contamination, but it still falls under the brownfield. Um, yeah, I was very interested in that as a possibility. One challenge, though, is there's a fair bit of wetlands. There's a stream that flows um, the east side of that parcel um and i believe it's also classified as some rare and endangered species habitats so there'd have to be some work around that um i did bring it up to some of the finance people about a year ago and they basically said well that could be interesting but we don't really have the capacity to develop any further projects 
at this time. Mm -hmm. And I just learned today that our current um, treasurer is moving on from Hampshire College. So we'll be even more shorthanded in the near future. Mm -hmm. um, but if, there, if the, in my dreams, it would be if there's some way that Hampshire could sort of lease that land and an organization could come in and maybe maybe do a community solar kind of development, that, yeah. that could be pretty cool. Yeah, and, and then tie it into the uh, to the Valley Green Energy as a, as a local source, right? <laughs> sure, if that if, yeah, if the timing is right. So, yeah, if if anybody knows of an organization that has the capacity to do that and might develop a plan and then pitch it to Hampshire, um, I I could help facilitate mm -hmm. the connections to Hampshire College people. Yeah, and 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 I listened to that uh, presentation uh, last night and thought it was excellent. And Stephanie yeah. did a great job as moderator too. But but the consultants were just so knowledgeable and so clear in what they were explaining. I sure would recommend it to uh, to you know, tell all your friends and neighbors to listen to that uh, recording. But yeah, and for a final point then regarding the farming and and, and solar is. Uh, I have learned that many farmers in Amherst are renters. They rent the property they're farming on. And so they have a concern that, oh, suppose the owner decides that he or she could make more money by uh, putting solar on the property than what they're paying in rent. And then there goes their livelihood. And so that that is, is a concern among uh, some of the farmers here in Amherst. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thank you again for all your good work. <laughs> thank you, Martha. And Eric has his hand up. Eric, you can go ahead and unmute. Thank you, Stephanie. And thank you, ECAC. I was very gratified by a number of comments um, uh, at this afternoon's meeting. Uh, Janet McGowan's comment on uh, preserving natural and working land, of course, is something very dear to my heart. Um, uh, um, Stephanie, your comment on conservation reminds me in how the in the 1973 uh, oil embargo that the US was um, uh, being crushed by, we were, we were universally encouraged to be conservative, to turn our thermostats up in the summer and down in the uh, winter, uh, we were forced to conserve gas. Um, um, speed limits were reduced. So I think there is something to be said for conservation. Small numbers always add up and they may not be the huge impact that we're looking for, but they do add up. And um, Laura, your comment about um, regionalization, uh, which I have uh, I know we at Smart Soil Amherst have been um, pushing for, um uh the to enlarge our thinking and make it and kind of begin to impose a, a larger more regional if nothing at the very least maybe statewide countrywide approach given that um, laura you mentioned the you showed us the new york times front page clearly the world is as uh um, as uh, um, I forget his name, Friedman, Tom Friedman said, "The world is flat. We are, we are, we are all neighbors to each other." So I was very, very gratified uh, to hear um, the idea of, reg of regional, more regional approach. It also kind of, for me, begs the the question about here we are living in a town with that more than doubles in size when we when we add our students into our um, overall aggregate population, and why we can't um, work as partners with our three campuses. Um, I'd heard recently that Amherst College, and this was, uh, um, uh, this was, I can't say it, I fact-checked it, but Amherst College was looking largely at a geothermal operation, leaving, thus leaving large arrays of parking lots potentially to be canopied. Why we, why we can't talk to our colleges and the university about what their plans are, given that um, we invite um, members of the college community to 
formally and when town meeting was functioning to run and be participants in town meeting to be on town committees in fact probably run for town council why we can embark on a conversation about what the plans are to help mitigate the extreme consequences of climate change or what the strategies for doing that are with our campuses so i was delighted to hear laura talk about regionalization and go as far as talking about uh, South Deerfield, Deerfield, et cetera. But we, in, from, from working in concentric circles out from town hall, we get to UMass, Amherst College and Hampshire College sooner than we do to uh, South Deerfield. So I would encourage us to think about this as not simply a specific town the population of 24,000 people as our problem, that we have tens of thousands of students and campus, and many um, hundreds of acres of, of campus um, <clears throat> to be um, harnessed as well. So again, thank you very much for um, looking at this from a 360 degree um, problem solving issue. Thank you. That's that. I really appreciate. It. Just and a re quick reminder, Eric. Too, we have Dwayne is highly connected to the UMass planning process. Steve at Hampshire and Laura, while no longer at Amherst College, I yeah. believe wrote the plan, and and which is public and available on their website uh, to learn exactly how they're going about all that. So I think that that connection is. We're. we're we're, we're certainly aware and excited about and counting on what the colleges are doing. Yeah. Um, but it seems to me that we have in the pro this process of the, uh, with ECAC and Southern Bible Working Group, the process has kind of factored out the, the uh, uh, kind of embarking on a strategy that folds in the campuses as part of the solution to our town issue, towns, region, state, country, world issue. But I wondered, well, you know, can that be not reignited because it's not been ignited, but can that be ignited? And can that be um, part of the strategy of how we can, uh, Martha Hanner just mentioned this, the niche report, which I've spoken about many times, has had and not only the, the 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 Clark House and Fort River, the middle school rooftops, but um, but the seventeen acre brownfield that that Martha said, which is a, which is a, across from the admissions office on one sixteen. So I'm wondering if we all can, given that we are a town and gown community, whether we can have a town and gown. Um, uh, strategic planning process that helps us kind of get to where we want to be and in mitigate helping to mitigate um, our greenhouse gas emissions. Yeah, I got it. Got it. That makes sense. Um, does anyone else do we address that or do we move ahead? I misplaced my agenda in the melee. I, I don't, think... Jesse. I don't know if Martha still has her hand up again or didn't. Oh, thank you. Martha, I'm did sorry. you? I'm sorry. I'm going to need to to go. Uh, Laura's here, so we still have a quorum. So. <laughs> Thanks, Sandra. Thanks, Sandra. See you next. See you next meeting. Great. All right. Martha, Hands you can, are... I, I don't know, it's Martha's it's hand down now. Hand. I wasn't clear. Martha yeah. just put her hand down. So I think, okay. I think, that, I think we're good. I think she was just stretching. <laughs> um, so I think in well, turn, the next thing. I think we could adjourn. Um, thank you all very much for everything you do and have thank a great yeah. um, two weeks. Thanks, Thanks for stepping Jesse. in, Thank Jesse. Thank on the lead today. <laughs> Well done, Anything Jeff. to get out of doing the minutes. <laughs> Bye, all. Bye-bye.